Hello, good morning, and uh, no. um, thanks everyone for showing up today. Um, I apologize for my voice, uh, but I will do my best to speak as clearly as I possibly can. This is Kevin Whirling, Systems Analyst here at Envision New Mexico. Thanks for coming to AHI New Mexico, um, our adolescent health initiative. Uh, Jeannie Dalen will be presenting today uh, on uh, mindful eating. We did want to remind you that we are recording the session. Let me just get everything active. There we go. Um, just an intro slide there. So if you do wish to receive a CME or CEU or attendance certificate today, you do need to announce your name. You can do that through our chat box and hopefully that has already popped up. And I see Sherry and uh, John, Carrie, Sandra, are all on. Jane Beckley, welcome. Your computer video and audio, you can mute both of those or turn them on or off would be another way to say that. Um, that's down uh, by default, it's on your bottom left of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can also customize that. So if you've already done that, you already know what you're doing. Our disclosure and accreditation statements are on screen right now. We're required to post those in order to give you the CMEs. And we do partner with Molina and Blue Cross Blue Shield Centennial Care. Um, so if you do bring one of your cases to us during our case consultations, which we have one um, in two weeks, um, so, and that is part of our certificate program. So if you're part of our certificate program, you do need to sign up for that. Contact me or uh, Michelle is actually your, your better contact, but I, we work together. So um, we can make sure that uh, everyone knows what's going on. Um, so get your cases in. You can also be reimbursed for those case consultations um, up to $150 from Molina and it's, I believe, 74 or something from Blue Cross. So um, take advantage of that. It's a very underutilized service, and we would love for you to bring your cases to us, uh, uh, to our, our panel of experts. We also have asynchronous online training for this Moodle. It's kind of like Blackboard, if you're familiar with that. Uh, Go to our online training. It's at envision.unm.edu at this point. Uh, that will change in the next six months, but uh, that's where it is. Uh, go to online training and sign up there with the form. If you have any trouble with that, go to our staff page and uh, make sure to uh, contact myself or Michelle and we can help you out with that. Um, so Moodle will allow you to view the video just like we're doing right now, we're recording this session, uh, take a very short quiz, and then you get your CMEs for it, um, as well as your credit for, um, for, this, uh, for our uh, initiative. And at this point, if you would, uh, please let us know that you're out there, either unmute or you can use the chat box. And I'll chat out to everybody here in just a sec so it pops up for you. And uh, let us know who you are and where you're from. Hi, John and Sandra, Carrie. And at this point, I think probably we can go around the room and introduce our guests. Um, Andrea Anderson, QA Specialist here at Envision. And to introduce Jeannie Dalen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to AHI this morning. We have a light group here in the Envision studios. There's a lot of stuff going on here in uh, Albuquerque today and in Santa Fe, I believe, with the legislators. So um, I'm happy to be here presenting. And really what I'm hoping we can do in the next hour is uh, kind of 
do a, um, a second half that builds on Dr. Sauer, who presented a couple weeks ago on disordered eating behaviors. And I'm going to take it uh, one step further and go in a, in a little bit more clinical depth and introduce you guys this morning to some mindful eating skills that uh, can be useful, just some basic skills that you can give an introduction to mindful eating. This is a uh, topic that is near and dear to my heart. Again, I'm a clinical psychologist, but my research interests actually are centered around mindfulness-based interventions for youth and families. And uh, R34 grant that just finished this last year that I was PI on, we actually adapted and built a mindful eating curriculum that can be used for teens and for families. And so over the next couple of years, I'll be rolling out this curriculum as a training curriculum for health providers. It's for use in a clinic setting, um, either through, hopefully through Envision and through other places in in the Department of Pediatrics. So I'm happy to share this introduction with you this morning. As always, you know, if any questions come up or any thoughts or comments, please feel free to put in the chat box and uh, we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the end as well. So for today, really what I'd just like to go over is why mindful eating? And a lot of this, as I mentioned, builds on this idea about disordered eating behaviors. But we're gonna talk more about those sub-thresholds clinical behaviors and why so much of our eating today in youth and even I think ourselves has to do so much with being mindless. The fact that there's so much external influences going on in our environment and we tend to eat on autom And what is mindful eating? Really, what is just the core of it? What do we try to do when we engage youth and families in mindful eating skills? And then just to follow up, I wanted to give you guys two screening tools that you could use in the clinic. And we're going to do a short mindful eating exercise I'm going to go over so you could use. This was actually this hunger scale was one of the favorites for kids. So I thought this would be a good one to share with you guys this morning as well. So my question for you to start out with is thinking for yourself, with the adolescents that you work with in your clinic, how many do you think exhibit or could be uh, uh, engaging in disordered eating? And what I mean about disordered eating is Dr. Sauer had presented a couple weeks ago on clinical disordered eating, meaning we all are familiar with it, the anorexia, the bulimia, the, the, some of the binge eating disorders, but really you guys, what I see in my clinic and what I see with the majority of kids, especially who are dealing with weight issues, is that there's more of this sub-threshold clinical indicators that we see, meaning we it's more rare to see a kiddo that you think is going to make meet full criteria for anorexia or bulimia, but I will tell you the prevalence of actually these sub-thresholds, meaning unhealthy weight control practices where they're using diet pills or they're using smoking or the purging behavior um, as a way to control weight. Frequent dieting, which is a very controversial topic, I think, within nutrition, about how we think about dietary restraint. And I know that the nutrition field is moving more towards not dieting as a way to control weight, but really more just healthy eating practices. And so that is really what the mindful eating principles line up with, that it's not about dieting. A lot of my kids, even who are dealing with weight issues, tend to skip a lot of meals. A lot of them don't even eat during the school day, and then they come home and they kind of binge on snacks and, and all of these things uh, in, the, in their environment afterwards. And so what we want to be careful of is we want to start paying attention to those, the, those type of clinical indicators in eating. And then what we see a lot of is emotional binge eating, which of course is has to do with binge eating disorders, but it really comes from, and I'll go more into detail for this, but comes from that emotional, that heart hunger, where a lot of these kids are dealing with a lot of negative affect. And what we're seeing is that they're coping with that negative affect through their food choices or their eating behaviors. So even though disordered eating in terms of bulimia and anorexia is definitely something we should look out for. 
chances are it's going to be a little bit more rare in our clinical population. But subthreshold clinical indicators, these type of behaviors, they actually show in the literature that up to over 80% of overweight and obese adolescents engages in at least one of these behaviors. The reason why this is so important for us as educators and clinicians to look at is what we find is these disordered eating behaviors are actually correlated with these kiddos developing full clinical eating disorders in the future, where we actually get into the binge eating disorder, bulimia. What it's also shown is that those sub-threshold eating behaviors are highly correlated with continual weight gain even the dietary restraint. So even those kiddos who go on diets or are on and off dieting actually look over time to be gaining more weight than those kids who do not diet. And that's why dieting as a practice in nutrition has been um, not under fire recently, but I think we're really starting to take a look at what kind of advice we're giving uh, kids and youth and families in terms of actual nutrition information. What we also find is that if kids in middle school or even uh, high school engage in these disordered eating behaviors, it tends to follow them. So it starts a pattern in adult and in, in, um, in adolescence that leads into young adulthood. And so being able to uh, screen for this, get some uh, referral sources, do some treatment for this at, the, at this age can be very important for setting them up for success later on. What we find is that there's a huge psychological component to eating behavior. And I think that's why I am so fascinated as a psychologist actually in nutrition and mindful eating is because of the psychological underpinnings. If there's one thing I have found is that our eating behavior is so unique motion in some type of way. And so as we go through this talk today, I'm going to be telling, talking a lot and drawing those, those connections to the fact that eating is a psychological process. So it's no longer about just <coughs> nutrition information, education. Absolutely, it plays a huge role. But if we don't start to get underneath, underneath what's going on, the psychological missing a huge opportunity to really affect change in eating behaviors. What we find is kids, adolescents, families, adults, ourselves, negative affect, depression, the body dissatisfaction that comes from uh, the media, from school teasing. Uh, what we really find is that th those really drive those sub-threshold disordered eating behaviors. And what we're finding is that it's an emotional dysregulation strategy, meaning we eat our feelings. It's that if we don't know how to cope with the negative emotions and what's going on and the stress in our lives. And so we use food as a, as a coping mechanism to be able to deal with those feelings. What's exciting about mindful eating, and I decided, you know, we don't have a lot of time for me to go into really what, um, you know, mindfulness and meditation and mindfulness-based practices are. But what I hope you get out of this today is that mindful eating specifically actually targets the disordered eating behavior or including some mindful eating strategies in a type of treatment plan that also includes education and dietary, uh, you know, uh, pl treatment plans can really, I think, be a great benefit and cover a wide variety of behaviors. So, what we can understand about eating is that our eating information comes from two sources. There is the external facts, right? We do need to pay attention to food labels, ingredient lists, nutrition articles, the best practices of nutrition information. But what we tend to ignore in tradi traditional nutrition information or education is what's going on internally for that individual. Again, those psychological processes. And what we know is that internally, only the person's going to know what their kind of uh, status quo is in terms of when they feel hungry, when they feel, feel full. What are their likes? What are their dislikes? 
So what we have to remember is that both actually work together to make a food choice. And each provides its own different information and, and the skills that we need to have to be able to maneuver those, those, that information in our environment. We have to remember that only the person has access to his or her internal information. So exactly what mindful eating is and mindfulness is when we think about what mindfulness means, really at its true heart, it just means paying attention to actually what's going on in the present moment without any judgment or emotion that, that can kind of get in the way. So truly what we're all we're trying to do is let that person actually start paying attention to what's and what is that internal information telling them so then they can link it with the external education that we're able to give them. So why is the information not always enough? Why are we looking more towards these uh, mindful eating, more of these awareness exercises for the individual? So what we know of in the literature, and I'm sure you guys know clinically, is following dietary advice is most always short-term and goal-oriented. So meaning we go in, we get the advice, maybe we get a treatment plan, we get best eating practices, you really should be eating more fruits and vegetables, you should be cutting out your, your sugar-sweet beverages, and let's try to get more protein. Solid advice. But typically what you find is that when we give advice, we impose something from the outside in, it really is not taking advantage of what's the person cannot get truly motivated to actually do change if it doesn't fit with their their kind of values with their system with what they need for their own body so when we impose on the body from the mind meaning it's our mind telling us what to eat instead of paying attention to our body it actually starts to exacerbate that split between body and mind and that's what tends to happen in our society is we use our heads and external factors to decide when to eat, what to eat, how to eat, than actually just paying attention to what our body needs in the moment. So what happens is when we do dietary advice in education, it really takes the person's body's needs into account. And that's because you don't have access to that information. Only that person does. So what it tends to do is ignores all those psychological processes that affect eating behavior, the thoughts, the feelings, the body signals, that when we actually can become aware of them and pay attention to them, it actually really can intelligently guide our eating habits. It's, again, our bodies know what our bodies need, what our life needs in terms of food, nutrition, self-care, all of it if we can just pay attention and what it leads to when we just follow dietary advice or a nutrition article or you know one day bacon's good the next day bacon's not one day eggs are good the next day eggs are not now you can't feed your kids honey but oh wait now you can feed your kids honey dietary advice is changing all the time and so if i think if we become more um just more flexible in terms of how we we think about nutrition with our our our, our youth and our families it can really assist and decrease what's called behavioral fatigue and really all that means is we're doing something because we're supposed to Right, we're doing something because someone told us this is the best way. We don't want to get sick, and our mind is telling us, okay, we have to eat this carrot, and we're completely ignoring our body in terms of what we actually need. However, what we do know is there has to be some way to get to our body. And most kids and families that I work with, um, they really tell me, it's like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Like, what do you mean, like, my body, like, paying attention? I just know, like, when it's time to eat or, you know, we have things, we have practices already established. And it really shows that in our present environment right now, um, there's a lot of mindlessness happening and a lot of automatic pilot, what I call automatic pilot. So think about it for yourself, for your kids at home, for friends. You know, what do we do in the morning? We just get our newspaper, we pour our cereal, 
We eat until everyone's done. We clean our plate. A lot of times I have it sit here at our house, Chini, we clean our plate. We keep eating until everyone's done. You, we go to the movies. We always automatically get the extra large popcorn and the soda because that's the most um, you know, value added package that we can get. Uh, dinner parties, social eating, as we all know. You know, it's like you take a roll, you take another roll, ha ha, everyone's laughing, the dessert cart. I have and then what I call the case of the disappearing food which happens to me all the time is you know you'll have something in front of you and you grab a chocolate from a bowl you grab a chocolate from the bowl you grab a chocolate from the bowl and you tend to look down and you're like where the heck did the chocolates go and I'll do that too I'll be at my computer and I will have like some M&Ms or something and literally I go down to keep grabbing them and they're already gone yeah, I have no recognition of what it tasted like, how I ate them all, like all of it just kind of goes in a blur. And this is very common in our society where there's a lot of external visual cues that guide our eating instead of paying attention to what's going on. What we also find with uh, mindless eating or is that or like that cues that kind of guide our eating behavior that are external is those influences from the past we have a strong multi-generational family food culture here in New Mexico and we all know it and love it but what we find is if you're not giving dietary advice and education or skills that a family can use that fits in their current food culture, it's going to be, it's, it's just not going to work or it's just going to be short term. It has to really think and, and, and appreciate the, their ethnicity, the SES, food preferences, food availability. And so in mindful eating, what we really talk about is the fact that there's choices, choices that can be made given where everyone's at in terms of their bodies and their own kind of multi-generational family processes. Because what happens is our family shapes our eating behavior and it leads to powerful messages regarding food. So even just having families talk about the messages that uh, are given in the home around food can be one of the most fascinating discussions you can have with an adolescent and a family. Because what you find is typically adolescents have very strong opinions and parents have very strong opinions about how eating behavior happens even though it's typically not talked about. Um, it's one of those kind of nonverbal, unconscious behaviors because we all have to eat, we all have to survive, and so there's not usually a lot of communication. So even just talking to, what are the messages around food at home? Important to clean our plate, we're taught to feel guilty if we don't eat it all, and somehow worse in the situation of the starving children in Africa, which I heard all the time growing up. Um, the huge cost efficient portions of processed food, you know, the, the whole idea of, you know, what we eat at home is based on what we can get the cheapest of. And what I find a lot in larger New Mexico families and probably across the nation is food insecurity issues. And what I'll actually even find is that it's kids will tell me it's like if you snooze you lose in our family meaning if there's a large pizza that comes and I have two other siblings that I have to deal with then you better believe I'm going to be over there grabbing my four slices right away and so what tends to happen is again we use these external cues to guide all of our eating without really paying attention to what our personal body needs in the moment. So those invisible habits, again, those invisible messages regarding food, even asking your adolescents, you know, who's in charge of food decisions at home? Because what happens is a lot of times kids, it's just like, well, I don't know, my mom feeds me. And I'm not in charge of what I'm doing because, you know, it, that's not my job. But in adolescence, as they start to get autonomy, even just asking them who's in charge of their food decisions and letting them realize that if they become aware, they actually can make some of their own decisions. Maybe not always about what's on the table, but how it's eaten, 
Um, you know, what's the food climate? Do, do families sit down at dinner together? Uh, are, are the TVs and the computers on everywhere that kind of distracts us from paying attention? Are snacks and junk food highly available? Um, you know, anything like that, all of these kind of questions actually start to generate questions of awareness of like, you know, what really is going on at home regarding food? start making choices and becoming aware of their own processes. Again, not from outside in, but what's just going on for them. What I hear heard a lot is that, you know, one of the reasons why families don't always feel comfortable taking traditional education in terms of dietary information is that, well, our family just doesn't eat that. You know, like, I, I get that that quinoa is going to be really healthy for me, but we're not going there. So we really have to, again, remind ourselves that we can give, we can have the best, best nutrition plan there is, but if it's not fitting within the family and what they, what they feel comfortable with, it, it's really not going to work. Okay. So I am a huge proponent of thinking that, you know, I think mindful awareness exercises with traditional dietary information is the golden, like the combination of the two is really going to foster the most change. I think they can really prop is and what a lot of my kids and families talk about is that they get told what to do at the office so every time that someone wants to talk to them about nutrition it's you know they feel like they're getting lectured in terms of what i will say that though the nutrition and the diet information is necessary it really is important for us to understand what is in our food why are fruits and vegetables so healthy? Um, you know, what, what does protein do for our body? How to read a food label? It rarely by itself leads to long-term behavior change. And what we're actually doing is we're tending to exacerbate the problem that's already going on that we can unintentionally actually start to send negative messages regarding food. And as we saw with those sub-threshold clinical indicators, the depression, the negative affect, the body dissatisfaction, all that negative affect is actually can drive the disordered eating. So when we come in and say, hey, how come you're not eating more fruits and vegetables and stop drinking sodas? What we can do is that, you know, we start to send a negative message. You're doing it wrong. This is not the right way. You don't know how, let me tell you. And we tend to perpetuate the feelings of guilt the body dissatisfaction that can actually lead more to those psychological outcomes of depression, anxiety, hopelessness. That then lead to the disordered eating behaviors that we're actually trying to control to begin with, which is the unhealthy weight control behaviors, the binge eating, the emotional binge eating, the dietary restraints, the skipping meals, all of that. So it tends to be a little bit of a vicious cycle. So where mindful eating comes from is just at its heart is trying to create a sense of awareness around eating behavior for that particular person. Just becoming aware, meaning when we step into the present moment and step into the meal in front of us, the snack in front of us, wherever, wherever we're at, that we look at two things. What's our intention? For this meal surrounding our eating why are we deciding to eat right now why did we decide to eat this why is this much on our plate every all the choices that make up our intention and then just attention paying attention while we're eating actually tasting food paying attention to our body signals which is the exercise I'll be giving you guys is an introduction about how to get into our body and it's really, it's truly just that. It's very simple and it's theoretical underpinning. Very, it can be much difficult to practice in person. And even myself who teaches these groups, um, you know, I taught four last year. Even myself, I feel like I'm constantly having to remind myself 
to be mindful while eating and not let all those external influences get in my way. So it's really through awareness that can provide the most information for people that can guide them to find food and eating choices that work best for them. Outside of the family, the automatic pilot, those, you know, those influences that we're just, we just take for granted in our unconscious. This is actually one of my favorite quotes because when I, it's, it's awareness is like the sun and when it shines on things, they are transformed. And I'll tell you, when I first started into uh, mindfulness-based practices when I was in graduate school, a part of me, I'm not going to lie, was like awareness, like, okay, great, I'm, you know, I'm paying attention, like what, I'm already paying attention in life and it, that's not going to be enough. And I have truly, I truly underestimated the power of actually true awareness and just paying attention moment by moment to what's happening. It has shown me that just awareness alone, if you can really just take the time to be aware, take a moment, get into yourself, get into your body, that those slow exercises over time really lead to a powerful change. And I've seen it. So I always like to share this quote is that not to underestimate the power of just us being aware of what we're doing at any given moment, especially for kids around eating behaviors, because so much of what's going on right now is just they're not paying attention to what's happening. And ourselves, I think, sometimes, too. We have so much going on. We have our own pressures, our own families to feed. A lot of times the parents would be like, I'm so busy taking care of my kids, I forget about what I'm eating at home. And so it truly, I think, is awareness is a process for everyone, every member of the family, and I think as providers, yourself included. So when we work with mindful eating skills, what we're really trying to do is just get people back in touch with that inner dietitian, that inner wisdom. And what we know of, and I'm sure you guys have heard in the literature, is like, you know, when you look at kids, they actually know exactly how much to eat, what types of foods to eat. And they'll tell you, like, I'm full. Now I'm hungry. I like this. I don't like that. And so we really all start out with really knowing what our bodies need. And over time, what starts to happen with these mindless external influences, family messages, it really starts to cut ourselves off from our own bodies, from our own wisdom of what's going on. And, you know, there's a story that uh, a mindful eating teacher teaches or talks about that says, you know, when you think about kids when they eat during the week, you'll see a kiddo who at one meal just wants to eat mashed potatoes. And the next meal, it's all like corn and green beans and a little bit of a roll. And so what they find is they're not eating what we decide is like the perfect balance at each meal. Typically, that's what most what we do uh, normally is that our bodies crave different foods at different times. Sometimes it's going to want more fat. Sometimes it is going to want more fruits and vegetables. Sometimes it's going to need a little bit more salt. But that all in all, it balances itself over the course of a week, where instead we start to say, no, you know, we need these type of foods on your plate and you're not getting up from the table until you eat all of it and you're going to try it damn it if you're the last thing you do and so we start to we start to put these um these artificial boundaries on what you should eat and how you should eat it and we lose that inner wisdom and it becomes more mind-based so we have to think about food as emotion. Food is what brings families together. It's how we socialize. It's how we survive. And so it's how we uh, cope. I mean, it's emotional um, eating for a reason. It really helps, it actually can help with that. So it's um, the key importance when we're doing mindful eating is let's think about what's going on underlying. You know, physically what's going on, cognitively what gets in the way, of us, you know, choosing foods that our bodies need in the moment, and then what are those emotional triggers to eat? So, what we're going to focus on today that I'm going to give you guys in the next couple minutes is just even starting with the physical, actually just trying to give your, your the message that, hey, 
let's even start to recognize or respond to those internal cues of hunger. What it feels like to be hungry. What does it feel like to be full? Reminding ourselves that, um, you know, telling ourselves what's good foods versus bad foods can really set people up for an emotional roller coaster. The feelings of guilt, the depression, the when to eat, how to eat can really mess people up. And then emotional. We really get to the emotional where we start to identify our emotional triggers. Like, when do we eat when we're sad? What do we eat when we're sad, when we're angry, when we're bored? So we really try to get to that heart hunger. So if we think about the mindful eating plate, right, the myplate.gov, we talk about, again, where the balance, the perfect dietary advice would be fruits, grains, vegetables, proteins, dairies. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, some meals, that absolutely would be our body would crave portions of each one of those. But what mindful eating takes it a step further and says whatever's on your plate in the moment, even if it's not the perfect combination of the myplate.gov, can you take a moment and see, figure out how you got there, right? What, you know, observe what's happening in your body before you sit down to eat. Can you actually savor and pay attention to each bite of your meal without going off somewhere else? Really creating that awareness. Can you be in the moment? Most of my kids and my family say it was, it's so hard to turn off TVs, turn off phones, turn off computers, that we're, we're eating, um, we're not just eating anymore, we're eating in a tech, a tech universe kind of thing. And then non-judgment, non can you look at what's on your plate and be like, okay, this is where I'm at, this is what I have, and not give yourselves, you know, this is good food or bad food or feel guilty or wherever you're at. And what tends to happen is if you start to observe and really start to pay attention, then you know your body needs it. And so all foods are good because all foods we need, but when we pay attention to our body, it's in within proportion and balance. So I know that this is a very quick and dirty overview of mindful eating, but it's really more just to kind of get the juices flowing in terms of, you know, what else is out there in terms of behavioral treatment programs for adolescents and for families, and to just think that it's not just about dietary information, there's a huge psychological processes that underlie this, and I think all of us have seen it. And I think if we can get more to those psychological processes, the emotions around food, and just start to create a basic level of awareness, it really can help um, augment what's happening with our, with our state-of-the-art nutrition. So I did just want to follow up. For those of you who are at Dr. Sauer's lecture, a couple weeks ago, um, you, we had asked about eating screens, and I just wanted to share with you one of my easy favorites that are really, it's been used, widely used, standardized self-report measure of symptoms and concerns characteristic of eating disorders for high school and college populations, so the, the populations we're working with, and the E26, I went ahead and put the uh, the web link on the slides. And so this is just like a quick and dirty screener where you can start to take a look. But the nice part is obviously it, it tells the directions. It's like if you score greater than a 20, then it warrants further investigation in terms of clinical eating disorders. But there's also measure or questions on there that really get to those subclinical eating disorder behaviors that we tend to look at and that we're probably most likely going to find on um, in an overweight population, which is the just kind of emotional binge eating, the skipping meals, the on and off dieting, the diet pills, any of those pieces are gonna be on it as well. Another one for those that are interested is the emotional eating scale for kiddos and adolescents. And again, it assesses the extent to which the, the kiddo eats in response to emotions. And what I find is just having kids filling this out and then using it as a, um, a conversation starter can be amazing. And kids really 
they know, adolescents know when they're emotionally eating. And so it's a wonderful conversation starter to really talk about, you know, what are the triggers and what's going on. Again, anything that we can do to start creating some awareness around these behaviors. But what I do want to share with you as an actual tool, this is my favorite squirrel picture, and I think we all know and feel, have felt this before in our eating behavior where we're eating and it just, we don't know up from down. It's like the food just becomes its own thing and we eat and eat and eat until we're like, how the heck did that happen? All those external cues, right? So what I want to share with you guys today, this is one tool that you can use in your clinic that can take 15 or 20 minutes. And kids, of all the tools that the kids liked in our feast mindful eating group, this is one of the, the ones that they really gravitated towards. And I think it's because it's not ambivalent. It's very clear cut. There's a scale. There's visuals. So it really helps create this cognitive ability to start creating awareness in the body. So I'm going to give you, I have a few variations of the, scale, of the scale that you guys can use that I have up here. But what it basically is at is that if you think of a hunger scale, it's on a scale from 1 to 10, where 1 is that I am so starving, I'm feeling weak, lightheaded, dizzy, all of that. And then as it goes up, you know, you're slowly slow getting hungry. Maybe you're hungry, but you're not that hungry. Okay, I'm slightly getting hungry, all the way to neutral to a five, where it's okay. I'm at that. I'm at that that good balance point. And then from there, filling up, filling up, filling up to what my kids call the button popper, which is number ten, which is the Thanksgiving poof, like pants or buttons are flying. So that's so uncomfortable, sick that I'm I can't even breathe. Here's another version of it, but what's important and why I like to share this one is that it shows kids that it's not good to be on either side of the scale. And what I think kids a lot of times get the message is that if I start skipping meals, if I get so hungry that I'm, you know, I can't even concentrate in class and I'm dizzy, which a lot of my overweight kids say they do, then somehow I'm doing something helpful for myself. And I'm, you know, I'm making myself lose weight. But what we show them is that you don't want either extreme. You don't want to get so hungry that you're physically hurting, nor do you want to be so full that you're on pain on the other side. And so this is why I actually tend to use, I like the second one the best. This one's nice because it has the actual verbiage. It gives them verbs or, or wordage about what each number means. But here they really get a sense of, I want to be in the middle. So I need to pay attention to what's going on before I'm getting hungry and then after I'm eating, which is really nice. Here's two others that I used. Again, the hunger scale on top, just because, you know, kids sometimes like color. So there's a color scale. And then if you're dealing more with adolescents or younger kids, the peas in the pod at the bottom actually is a great one to use, too. And we do it the same way. It's like, you know, ouchie hungry. Like, there's not enough peas in my pod, all the way to ouchie full. There's too many peas in my pod, so to speak. So what you do is you give the, the scale to the kids and you just, you know, show that this is a way, this hunger scale is just a way for us to start to just create awareness in our own body. And so many times kids will tell me, like, I don't even, even parents, even adults, I don't know, I couldn't tell you. Like, we don't know this. We typically know the I'm hungry, the eight on the other side, all the way to the physical fullness I'm eight. Like, we go from one to the other. So what we're really trying to do is create these gradations of awareness where we can really say like, okay, I'm slowly starting to get hungry. I'm slowly starting to get full and really slow down the process. So what you have them start thinking about, and they can do this at home as well and with their families, is what does a zero feel like physically when you're extremely hungry? Have people describe for themselves what does that zero feel like? like the headaches, the irritation, shakiness, fatigue. 
And then we go to the other side. What does that tend to feel like when you're as full as you can imagine? The nauseated, the bloated, fatigue, swollen, those guilt, shame, feelings of guilt, shame. Then you can have them actually, if they're in your office, just ask them where they are right now on a scale from zero to 10. And what I like about that is like, what do you notice about your body that made you choose that number? Create some awareness. How do you know that you're a four? or a six, or a two. How do you know? And what you do is you tell them, see if you can journal over the next you know, day, I pick three days, I have them do it with their family, where they actually do a hunger rating before, during, and after each meal. And just have them note, what are the physical cues that led to the choice of that rating? Very different than the mind cues. Because most usually we use our minds to tell us when to stop eating and not our bodies. But what we're trying to do is have them tell you what their physical sensations were in their body. So that when they start to feel that expansion of the belly, they can be like, oh, now I'm full. Even though there's still half a cinnamon roll on my plate. And what we, you know, once they do that, and if they get comfortable with that, then you can have them, you know, experiment with eating to achieve a different level. Like, you know, um, it has how they felt one hour after achieving a hunger level of six versus eight, right? So what we'll find is um, the, the kiddo will be at a six, and, but it'll still have half a cinnamon roll. And I'll always hear that. It's like, but there's still the cinnamon roll, Jeannie. Like, I still want to finish again, an external influence guiding hunger instead of our bodies. And so what I'll have them do is we'll just pay attention, like one day, don't finish it and see what happens. And then, but then if you can't, like just see what happens. Again, it's all about awareness. And many times the kids will be like, yeah, the, I forgot all about the cinnamon roll once I took off and the six was great and I was like that all afternoon versus the eight where I felt gross all afternoon. And even though I ate the cinnamon roll, I really didn't need it. So again, this is just one exercise to really just start them getting to think about, you know, what they're putting in their bodies, more importantly, how much. And, um, you know, if we can let their bodies guide more, their bodies can tell them what they need and how much and when. Woo! So that I know was a whirlwind lecture on mindful eating. Um, again, I typically do a whole series on mindfulness and mindful eating, and we do experiential exercises, but this was really just to give you guys a very simple taste of why I think it's really helpful to include some awareness-based practices um, into your clinic and things that you can just start conversations about emotional eating. Kids want to talk about it. It's the one thing I've learned is it's a huge topic. It's those behaviors are in about 80% of our overweight kids, but they're also in our at-risk kids as well. I think kids across the board actually deal with some disordered eating behaviors. So anything that we can do to help create awareness, I think is, is a good thing for them. And this hunger scale is just a very simple technique to be able to do that. So that is it for today. So, Jeannie, we do have a question from Sherry, and Sherry, um, you're sending this to me privately, so um, you can change that to everyone um, on the, if you see where it says two, just so you know, um, but I did catch this. So, we have all heard about the importance of eating breakfast. Within this context of mindful eating, how does one respond to someone reporting that they are not hungry first thing in the morning? Yep, absolutely. Great question. So again, here's one of those areas where best practice dietary nutrition is confronted with internal information. And it is exactly it. From a mindful eating perspective, you always put um, internal preferences first. Because if again, if you force dietary information from the outside and say you need to eat breakfast, then really it's just, again, starting that behavioral fatigue. It actually can lead to more psychological issues regarding the, the behavior that you're trying to change. Um, now, what I do say to that, though, is many times people will say, well, I'm not hungry, 
but it actually comes from an external factor that actually their bodies are hungry. Like when they do, like for example, Sherry, I've done the hunger scale before where, or kids will say like, I thought I really didn't want to eat lunch at school. I thought, you know, it's just because I wasn't hungry. But then I started to really realize I was just telling myself that because I felt uncomfortable eating in front of the kids at school. And so once they really kind of responded to what their body, they were able to say, oh yeah, no, my body really is hungry. So I would say one, always respect personal preferences. There's no good and bad way to eat. There's good and bad ways to eat for that person. And if hunger in the morning, and I'm one of those people who it's very difficult for me to eat breakfast. And so I pay attention and sometimes my body needs breakfast and sometimes it doesn't. But I at least would allow them to explore whether or not them not being hungry truly is because they're not hungry or because there's something going on in the mind that says, I don't need to eat breakfast or I don't have time for breakfast or I don't like what my mom cooks for breakfast. Those are more mind things and not really pay attention to our body. I hope that helps. I mean, I think this is an excellent question. It gets to where what you know what's practice and well what i'm also thinking about is um from a parent's perspective you know you know you're going to send your kid to school and you know if they get hungry at 10 o'clock they're not going to be able to just go eat because they're in class right so then you know they're not going to eat till lunchtime right and so how are they going to be in class what is their mindset and Absolutely. And our, don't we always do that? We always uh, talk about, you know, we eat because later on we're not going to be able to, or we got to do this now. And so what we do yeah. is we start to put artificial conditions barriers. on our body, yeah. barriers, yeah. and then we don't pay attention anymore. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of kids or a lot of mindful eating teachers will say too, is that um, really uh, have snacks like so they'll have like a snack in their locker yeah. or something that so then at 10 o'clock if something comes up they do have something that they can turn to mm -hmm. but i agree there's a lot of artificial mm -hmm. boundaries on, on on eating especially in school yeah yeah felicia oh good helpful presentation i'm curious to know how you integrate this work into your practice yeah do you have visits that focus just on eating habits or is eating on a list of things you are addressing with the child do you weigh kids as part of the visit? What kind of follow-ups? How long? These are all excellent questions. I'll tell you, um, it depends on your personal practice. There's actually different ways that you can integrate this. I'll tell you for mine, Felicia, what I tend to do is eating typically, I'll see some kids just for mindful eating, and in that case, if it's just for overweight issues, then I'll focus on um, eating habits and then mindful eating as well as dietary information. But sometimes it's like I'm seeing a kid for actual, she comes in for anxiety or depression and we're working on that. And then I can, you know, we, we get to food as a coping mechanism. And so you really just have to judge it on each kiddo. Um, I do not weigh kids as part of my practice in terms of my private practice, but what I do do is uh, for our research, we, we, we do that as part of our, our visits. Um, Follow-ups. I tend to always like to do at least four to six like four sessions of mindful eating. Um, again, like giving them the hunger scale and then talking about that afterwards and then following up with maybe the emotional eating scale and talking about emotional triggers. So there's definitely ways you can just plant some seeds that doesn't mean you have to do it long. My visits in my private practice are up to 15 minutes because I get time one-on-one -on -one as a clinical psychologist to talk. But, uh, but you know, in the clinic, for example, these rate your hunger scales, you can do these tips like or do these uh, exercises in about 15 to 20 minutes. So really it's it's nice because you can integrate this in a way that kind of works for you in your clinic. Great. Our programming for our kids will begin in a few weeks. Excellent. Can you email out the presentation slides? Absolutely, Rochelle. All of those are on. And I will keep everyone up to date as well because through Envision, we like to do the more in-depth mindful eating training that has a lot more of the exercises that you can use as well. So um, I find the kids resonate with this and they're they're easy and they're different because, you know, they're 
um, they're not easy in terms of the kids being able to pay attention, but kids are like, okay, this is something that I can try. So um, I find them helpful as well. And Kevin put up the link for the slides. So thanks everyone for joining. Again, um, this is just a quick and dirty overview and feel free to contact me if there's any questions. Also, I do see kids through my private practice for this, so we can always, I can always uh, take referrals and work with if you have any individual kids that you're interested in really getting some, some more in-depth work on uh, psychological processes regarding eating behaviors um, on your woman. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, have a great week and we'll be in touch soon about the rest of AHI for the spring semester. Thanks everyone.